Hello there everyone, Art Burns here, wishing you well today. I hope you're all having a great day today. And I welcome you back to the podcast and back to the YouTube channel. And I want you to know that I'm really happy to be here to talk to you today. And so what I wanted to talk about on this beautiful Thursday morning is uh, running. <laughs> and, and while I am not a runner personally, unless somebody is either chasing me or I am late for a flight or a bus or something, <laughs> I am not running, right? Like That's not my thing. Um, but r there's a story in the history of running that really speaks to, to what I've been talking about this week about how our thoughts can create the the reality in which we live and, and can often you know create um, limitations to the reality in which we live right so the story that i want to tell you about today is the story of the four minute mile right now for many many years for the history of running up until 1954 nobody had been able to run a single mile in less than four minutes now it's not like they were running it in eight minutes or five minutes or, you know. Um, in 1945, in fact, nine years before the four minute mile was finally broken, somebody ran the, four, the, four, uh, the mile in uh, four minutes and four minutes, one second, 1 1.4 seconds or something like that, right? So, so meaning that people were within a second and a half of breaking the four minute mile for nine years, right? And it wasn't that people weren't trying, people were trying. There's much, much evidence that people saw this as the holy grail of running, right? Like to break that four minute mile. So people were striving and trying and trying over and over and over again to break this, this threshold, but yet nobody could come within two seconds of breaking the four minute mile, right? Until a 25 year old medical student by the name of Roger Bannister, okay? He ran a race in Oxford, England in the spring of May 6, I believe it was of 1954 in Oxford, England at 6 p.m. after having worked a, a shift at the hospital and the conditions were rainy and windy and so windy that they almost called the race off. But under these conditions, on his feet for 10 hours, <laughs> running in, in wind and rain, as you can imagine in the, you know, the springtime of, of England in the evening, right? He, he broke this four minute mile and he did it in three minutes, 59.54 seconds, I believe it was. So again, we're talking about a two second difference that took nine years to, to break. Right, so that to me is fascinating, right? And the reason why it's fascinating to me is because it was seen at the time as an unbreakable record. It was seen as something that was not attainable. Like physically, it was impossible. That's the way it was thought of because of how many people had tried to do it and how many people had failed, right? Interestingly, um, the same year or the year before, year after is the, is the time when Sir Edmund Hillary finally for the first time was the first human to reach the, the, uh, the summit of Mount Everest, which also was something that was considered impossible. Right, and so Sir Edmund Hillary climbed the mountain. Uh, Roger Bannister, who actually was knighted also, so it's Sir Roger Bannister. Uh, he ran around the track, you know, fast enough to to do it, it to do a mile in less than four minutes. Okay, now here's what's really interesting about this. Okay, like Everest, which is now routinely climbed by people, right? Like it's every year somebody gets up to the top of Everest, right? It's no big deal. Well, I mean, it's a big deal, obviously. It's not easy, like I couldn't do it, but, but it's not like it's this thing that's not possible. Like it's been shown over and over and over that it can be done now, right? And just like that, the four minute mile, it was only like a month later that somebody else broke the four minute mile. And since then, thousands of people have broken the four minute mile. Right. In fact, the, the record now is like three minutes and 20 seconds or something like that. And it's not even considered. A, I mean, I don't think they even like take note of people who do it in less than four minutes, even though among runners, apparently it is still, um, you know, they call it a four miler. Like, you know, like, you, you know, that's, that's a big milestone for people who who run track. Right. And not everybody can do it. But but certainly 
it's been done oh, like 1,500 times or something like that since 1954, that somebody has broken that four minute mile, right? And, and it happened within a month of, of, you know, after nine years of not being able to, to get more than two seconds, but within two seconds of that, that threshold, within a couple of months, several people broke the record. So what does that tell us? And why is this important to what our thoughts are, right? Because what happens is when somebody finally broke it, now everyone after that person, everyone after Sir Roger Bannister believed it to be possible, right? It was no longer this thing where they thought that it was not possible, Right? It was something where, okay, well, if somebody did it, then I know it can be done. So now I will just do it. Now, it's very interesting also that Roger Bannister, right? He was a medical student. As I said, he, you know, he did not, it's not because of training. It's not because of weather, obviously. You know, he actually, the, the, you know, because of his busy schedule as a medical student uh, and interning at the hospital and everything like that, he actually, famously, the only times he was able to train was like on his lunch hour. And he would just run as fast as he could on his lunch hour for every minute of his lunch hour and then go back to work. Like, it wasn't like some kind of, um, you know, technological advancement or some training thing. But here's something that's interesting, is that Roger Bannister went on after graduating medical school and retiring from running a couple of years after this, this race, went on to become a neurologist, right? And, ta and, and his specialty was, um, uh, you know, the, the autonomic nervous system which is what we talk about here on this podcast and on this, uh, this YouTube channel. And so, so it's very interesting that, that he was so, um, you know, so engaged and so, so absorbed in the way the brain and the mind works, right? And so this is the guy that finally broke it because he, he psyched himself into it, right? That's the, that's the takeaway here, right? And, um, and it, it's rumored, the, the lore is, and he's written a, he wrote a book about this. I mean, he died a few years ago. He died, I think, in 2018 um, at 88 years old, I believe it was. Uh, and he, um, he wrote a book about this this whole thing. Uh, you can go check that out. I have not read the book. I've just, you know, researched a bunch of articles and read a bunch of articles leading, you know, because it just fascinated me once I learned about this. Um, but there's lots of information out there. So you can check that out. But uh, apparently the lore is that, and there's also a movie about it. Uh, there's a, the lore is that he came up with a new sort of training method Right? And again, it's not that he was training in some special way because, again, he was only able to train during his lunch hour. So my feeling is that it was this kind of training. Right? It was psychological training that he, he created for himself the thought that this can be done. Right? And so then he went out and against so many odds, he did it. Right? And again, once he did it, several other people within a month somebody else broke it, right? So nine years, nobody can come within two seconds. Then all of a sudden, two people in one month, right? And then somebody after him. And then so like every year after them, like other people were doing this, right? And again, that is because they thought that it was possible, right? And so what happens in our lives, right? When we think that we're not able to do something, Right? When we think that there's no way we could become this thing that we want to be, there's no way we could, you know, um, you know, break these bad habits that we have, there's no way that we could grow out of some limiting belief that we have, right? All we have to do is believe that we can, right? And that's a thought, right? That's not a, you don't necessarily need proof, right? Roger Bannister did not have proof. Right? Because nobody had done it before him. Sir Edmund Hillary, the same way. In fact, if anything, they had lots of proof against what they were trying to do. Right? There was so much evidence that this is impossible. But the thought that they had was that, no, it's not impossible. It's just that no one has done it yet. Right? I often tell my clients that, that the word yet is such a tiny little word, but yet it's the most, but yet it's the most powerful word in the, the language of humans. In whatever, whatever language you translate that word into, it's the most powerful word. Because what it tells you 
is that it takes something from I can't do something to I haven't done it yet, right? So that's what Roger Bannister and Edmund Hillary, this is what they both said to themselves, right? That, that I, you know, that, that it's not that it can't be done, it's that no one has done it yet and I am going to do it. Right? And so, so when we take that kind of belief into what we're doing in our lives, right? Whether it's, you know, you want to make a certain amount of money, you want to uh, get a certain status of some sort, you want to reach some kind of goal, right? Whether it's work, whether it's relationship, you know, you, you feel like, you know, <laughs> I remember back when I was single, there were, there were times where I felt like, okay, I'm never going to find someone that, that's, you know, that's that thing that I believe in, right? Like we get that way of thinking, right? And now I have a beautiful family with a, a loving wife and two beautiful children that, you know, that, you know, it's like you go from this, this sense that you just can't do something and just saying instead, I just haven't found it yet. Right. And that's the difference between people who succeed and people who do not succeed. Right. When, when people who, you know, th there's basically three ways to get what you want in your life. Right. There's the sort of, um, you know, just go out and get it the acquisition kind of thing, right? Just just going and doing it, right? Like, like, you know, like I don't care what it takes, I'm gonna work all night, I'm gonna, you know, do whatever I gotta do to just make it happen, right? But then there's also this sort of, um, you know, psychological, like, uh, you know, law of attraction kind of thing, right? Where if I just elevate my, my, you know, energy to a certain level, I will attract good things, right? But then there's the, the, the creation, right? Then there's the way to create you, what you want, right? And that's the kind of thing that Sir Edmund Hillary and Sir Roger Bannister did, right? It wasn't that, I mean, plenty of people before them had tried to just go get it, right? But the problem is that, that when you feel like you just can't get it, then you feel like, okay, it's impossible because I, I, I tried everything I have and it just didn't work, so it's clearly impossible. So now I have to abandon that goal and go for something else, right? You know, people who believe in things like the law of attraction and believe that, you know, just by, and I'm not saying they're wrong, but, but when you sort of put your, your um, you know, kind of um, trust or, or, or efforts into that kind of, um, you know, kind of method, right? To just attract what you want by your positive energy, right? then when it doesn't happen, a lot of times we feel like, okay, well, the universe is just, you know, not gonna allow it. So again, it's something that's impossible. So I'm gonna abandon that goal and I'm gonna go for something else, right? But when we talk about creation, and this is why the most successful people in the world, this is the way they look at things, right? And again, it comes back to that word yet, right? When you don't get what, you think you you know when you don't reach that goal that you're striving for right that you're that you're 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 dedicated to right you don't feel that it's impossible you don't feel that it's just you know you can't do it you don't feel that the universe is conspiring against you right you just feel like it just hasn't happened yet and i just have to keep going i have to keep walking this path. I have to keep, you know, sh you know, kind of um, keep on the course and keep at it. Just like Roger Bannister and Edmund Hillary did in the mid 1950s. And then, you know, and look again, once they did it, <laughs> thousands of people believed it could happen. And then they went out and did it too. Right? So the, the takeaway here for you all folks is to, you know, again, just, you know, it's not necessarily about uh, tricking your mind into it, right? But it's about believing that you can do it, right? And it's about thinking the thoughts that are going to put you closer to that thing. Right. It's about it's about thinking about the, you know, because remember what we said the other day. Right. Is that as we think about things. Right. Then we're going to our, our brains are naturally going to filter out the evidence against what we think and present to us only the evidence that we that, that confirms what we think. Right? It's a bias of the mind. It's a physical functioning of this little guy here, right? It's like it's like an internal algorithm, right? Just like on Facebook, right? Facebook is only gonna show you the things that you are looking at, 
right? That's the way the algorithm, algorithm works, right? Well, your mind has a similar way of working and your physical brain has a similar way of working, right? It's going to filter out those things that, that contradict what you believe in and it's, or, or what you think about and it's going to just show you the, the thing, the evidence that confirms what you think about. So if Roger Bannister were alive today and we were having a conversation, I'm sure he would say something along these lines. And I'm sure in his book he says something like this. And I'm sure that, it, that it's true that for Edmund Hillary as well, that they just thought they could do it. Despite all the evidence, right? They thought they could do it. And therefore, you know, in their day-to-day -day experience, as they were training, as they were preparing, they saw evidence that, you know what? I can do this. I will do this. I can do this. I will do this. And, and eventually, it happened. Right now, who knows if Roger Bannister thought he, I mean, it might be in his book, who, you know, maybe he thought that he would have done it a year earlier. But again, he didn't abandon it. Because he didn't feel, you know, again, he used that word yet, right? <laughs> like he, he just, he knew that it was just a matter of time because he felt, he believed, he thought that he could do it. So I want you all to try this. I want you all to start thinking in terms of, you know, I can be that person that I want to be. I can be that parent that I want to be. I can be that professional level of whatever it is that you do for a living. I can do these things right? And don't give up on them, right? Even, and, and when you start to see evidence against what you're, what you're thinking, now this is where the thoughts can, can be, you know, kind of a, a block for us, right? And so when you feel evidence, when you, when you notice and you start feeling like, okay, well, things are showing me that I can't really do this. What I want you to do is use your thoughts then and think the opposite, just for a minute, right? Just, just, just challenge yourself. Just, just challenge the fact that maybe your thoughts are not real, are not true, right? And think the opposite. Just say, well, what if the opposite is true, right? What if all this information, all this evidence that I'm seeing is actually not true? What if, what if the opposite is actually true? And you might be amazed to find how that changes things for you, how that, that helps you to embrace that yet, Right. All right, folks. Well, I hope you enjoyed this and uh, I hope uh, I hope this helps you to to kind of go through your life and, and, and think, you know, think that you can do it and then do it. Right. Just like these these inspiring individuals from half a century ago. Right. And if you have any questions or if you'd like to talk further about this, OK, and if you'd like to maybe get some training on how to, you know, bring because because part of part of what we're talking about here is bring awareness to the thoughts right? And the nervous system, right? And how it all works, right? When we can bring awareness to it, we can see like, oh, look at that thought right there. You know, it's telling me I can't do this thing. So let me put a yet in there. <laughs> let me, let me, you know, challenge the thought and see if putting a yet in there changes the way that I feel about it, changes my emotional attraction to it, and therefore makes it more possible for me. Check it out, folks. I really would love to hear from you if, if you have any thoughts about this. And again, if you'd like some training on this, please just hit me up and I'd love to have a conversation and see if we can work something out. See if there's a, a way which, in which we could uh, you know, get together and, uh, and work on this together. It, it's amazing when you have someone to collaborate with and somebody to, to kind of keep you on track with this, right? To, to kind of you know, make sure that you're keeping challenging these thoughts right? That's sometimes the biggest problem because, you know, we have these thoughts for a reason, right? They're the thoughts we've been thinking our whole lives. So sometimes it's just a matter of having somebody to reflect back on you like, hey, yeah, remember, this is what you're thinking. So let's challenge these thoughts. And week by week, when you do that, amazing things happen after a pretty short period of time. So I hope to hear from you. And uh, if not, I, I wish you well. And I hope you enjoyed this video and this podcast. And I will be back again tomorrow with some more. Take care, everybody. Thanks a lot.